Might as well get the show on the road then. Um, so originally I was meant to kind of give this talk um, after well, in the same session as Gayon a few weeks, yeah, months ago now. Um, I got COVID at the time, and so I was in no place to be standing up here and sounding coherent. Um, but kind of the purpose and point of this talk today, um, I've got to stand over here because I'm recording it for people in New Zealand and Europe, um, is kind of like to describe uh, my practices as a designer, a researcher, and an educator as well, just so you can kind of get to know what I'm about, what I do, how I practice, um, and also uh, if there's any kind of affinities between like what you like to do as a designer researcher as well. Um, you know, feel free to come share those. We can perhaps work on some uh, research projects together. Taking it back to a little bit of landscape history, because um, it kind of frames what I do and what this talk is a little bit about. Landscape architecture as a profession can be cut up in, in how it started in many different ways. Um, the way I tend to break it up is in the late 17th, early 18th century when lots of um, very affluent uh, young white men from England travelled across Europe and did what's called the Grand Tour. And so they would um, be sponsored by their parents or a benefactor and they would travel in groups, basically like a great big, um, in New Zealand we call it an OE, basically a uh, whole year of basically partying across Europe. So they'd go to all these amazing landscapes which are so radically different um, than the very pastoral, but kind of a little bit craggy up in Scotland landscapes of England. Um, and they'd take these learnings, these, these incredible landscapes they encounter which are so radically different from the sensible landscape of England in a way, and start to convert those into poems, into paintings, um, and describe how it kind of started to shake or sh um, and shape their um, way of understanding the world. These landscapes kind of broke their habitual means, their kind of categorical means to understand how the la landscape worked, how culture and religion interact with, the, with that as well. And so you have these fantastic paintings emerging out of that period a very cliché one being the wanderer about the sea of fog. So whenever you hear someone talk about the sublime, they're nearly always going to bring out this painting. But this is the time of the Enlightenment, right? So the Enlightenment period was where science, the scientific method came about. And the key part of that was the removal of the church as a single sole repository of knowledge. So prior to that, the Bible more or less was taken as, as gospel, as it was. It was literal. But up until that, after that point, we have the Enlightenment, we have a scientific method, method as a means to understand how geologic time and landscape processes work, and also a shift of understanding of power and scale. So this is kind of a, a shifting away from seeing God as the, the biggest, most powerful entity out there, and actually understanding landscape as that kind of preeminent um, entity or agent in the world. And as part of that, you have the Enlightenment citizen, the scientific citizen. People really strove to be seen as an Enlightenment citizen, to be able to understand a new science and look at the world through that new kind of way. So you have this kind of a real, this first time we have scientific dominance being, you know, really unrivaled in the world. There were some earlier uh, examples of that, particularly in the Middle East, Iran and Baghdad, and you know, present day Iran and Iraq. Um, but the Enlightenment coming out of Venice, Northern Italy, uh, really kind of set that whole world on fire at that point. And that's all tied to um, things like colonialism as well. But counter to that, we have the, le we have the rise of aesthetics. And that notion of aesthetics really um, is central to what I do. And aesthetics is a term which is typically very poorly understood um, as within designers. Designers are awful at understanding that. Um, but even, uh, I guess, the general lay layman, he probably has a slightly uh, more slippery grasp on that term. So when I'm using the word aesthetics here, I'm not talking about the look of something or that is aesthetic. I'm talking about aesthetics as a as a kind of a, a means to understand the world, how we encounter the world. Um, things like taste and things like that are part of it, but it kind of goes beyond just um, this aesthetic or that aesthetic or taste. So it's kind of like how we encounter and grapple with the world more than a categorizing of things. As in contrast to that um, rise of scientific dominance, we have uh, encounters with the world or experiences of the world which just go beyond that. These people were struggling to categorise certain experiences, like literally encounters with the world, encounters with geologic scale and force, which couldn't be described through mere metrics and quantities. And so that's why the aesthetics emerged out of that period. We had kind of um, some you know, inklings of that prior to that, but as a philosophical and political field, aesthetics emerged out of that time. 
which merge at the same time and through landscape architecture. Landscape architecture is tied all into this. And so we have Ashfield and Ebola um, describing a felt of this period in particular to articulate the complexities of affective experience. Experience going beyond um, you know, uh, rational uh, causality, forces acting on us and with us. And as far as that relates to landscape architecture, we have two of the most important names of that period, Sir Uberdale Price, author of Essay on the Picturesque as Compared with the Sublime and the Beautiful. And both him and the following gentlemen are important because they're both designers, philosophers, poets, politicians, and in the case of Richard Payne Knight, an archaeologist as well. They're polymathic. They're talking about all these things and experimenting with them all at the same time. So these guys, they were very rich. Um, they had lots of money behind them. They had their own estates. And so they were designing landscapes. They were designing their own landscape and experimenting with these aesthetic forces, these kind of new ways of understanding the world directly through landscape design. That's their other friend, Richard Payne Knight. They were lifelong friends up until the very end, and it turned into a very bitter spat, and they never reconciled it. So they died having known each other for a very long time, uh, but only a very short period of the end. Um, it all fell apart, which is one of the tragedies of uh, landscape architectural history, I think. And so right now, kind of bringing it back to kind of where I'm all situated on this, is we're currently sitting in the age of a second enlightenment, right? We have the absolute dominance for the last 30, possibly going back to the 60s, yeah, 60s up until now, I'd say, second period of enlightenment, where we have scientific dogma kind of um, pushing everything out in a way. And it may not be, that may kind of sound a little bit um, uh, bristling here, but coming from a post-colonial country where indigenous knowledge, ways of producing and knowing, has been actively pushed out through the education system, through politics, through law enforcement, everything. Um, that's now, you know, through countries like us, Canada and Australia, we're now recognising the limits of that scientific dogma. And how that comes through design, so that's why a lot of really interesting stuff is coming out of Australasia at the moment in relation to this, because we're really embodying that, those other ways of knowing and producing. And Bruno Latour, um, who recently died, I think last week, or the week before, um, he kind of summed it up really nicely. We need to shift from matters of fact, scientific matters of, of you know, ways of understanding the world, to matters of concern, where we're taking into account things much more than facts and metrics. And so my kind of practice revolves around looking at landscape as a laboratory in the kind of the exact same way that Richard Payne Knight and Uberdale Price were, really experimenting directly with the landscape itself where possible, of course. Um, I'm not the most uh, kind of gardeny or tools kind of guy, but experimenting with real landscapes, right? How to move away from seeing and viewing and designing with landscape as a closed scientific system, how to engage with that aesthetic realm, how to deal with the real openness of landscape itself and work in the same way that those um, original thinkers were because that's how landscape architecture emerged was from that kind of polymathic engaging with science, engineering, politics, poetry all at the same time. And so a lot of the content I'm going to talk about today is coming out of my PhD. Um, so practice-based PhDs are much different than PhDs in American universities. So for me, designing was both how the research was done but also what was being researched. So even though there's a hundred odd thousand words in there, there's about 700 drawings in it as well. So when you're using, using design as a research method. So kind of broken up into, I think, four categories today, kind of explain what my interests are and how I attack them. First of which is kind of rethinking this idea of ecology. Julian Raxworthy, a Australian landscape architect and academic, um, previously taught at UVA, Saudi Arabia, and I can't remember which one it was in South Africa, but a prominent one there. He's now program director in Perth, I think. Um, but he noted that ecology has become an algorithm. Ecology doesn't enclose, it's what can only be quantified. He's, you know, he's saying as a designer that we've cut ecology down to such a point that can only be, we're only engaging with ecology through numbers and metrics, right? That, kind of re that really resonated with me as a massive problem in the discipline. And if we trace that back, kind of a little bit of a hidden, untold story of the discipline, right? Current discipline of landscape architecture is really characterised by landscape urbanism. What a lot of landscape architects don't know is that landscape urbanism was an architect's playfield. That came, it developed from architecture. That came from when several prominent architects on the east coast of the states here invited Deleuze and Guattari, two prominent French uh, philosophers, 
over to give a series of workshops, and they were talking about urban fields and philosophy, and these architects were interested in that. They wanted to move away from the architecture as the object and play with urban fields. So architects were playing with landscape at that kind of scale way before we were. And so what happened? Landscape architects started to see what was going on there and started to appropriate that language, appropriate that means of designing. But as part of that, part of that whole lineage from architecture, particularly out of several key schools here in America, particularly the GSD up at Harvard, uh, you have individuals like Manuel Delanda um, as being a kind of chief mediator or theorist translating those um, philosophical theories to design, focusing on certain aspects of that original philosophy. So Manuel Delanda focused on the technical and scientific aspects of um, the and Pari's writing on ecology, completely and utterly, um, not necessarily willfully, but um, obs you know, obscuring or ignoring the, the overwhelming aesthetic dimensions of their work. And so we have uh, a design ecology, a design sense of ecology which doesn't deal with aesthetics, doesn't deal with how we engage with the world. Um, so this has only just been really recently noticed. We have Simone Brott in her book from 2011 describing that exact process I just very hastily described to you um, in architecture. Peter Connolly's PhD thesis from RMIT did the same thing for landscape architecture in 2012 and he's talking here next week. Um, and then we have Beyondisms, a cult, uh, conference I think held in Sweden in 2016 which is really a whole critique of, every, of everything I've just described to do with landscape architecture um, from a landscape architectural perspective, kind of unpacking all that baggage which hasn't been critiqued in the last 30 years, unpacking all those assumptions. So you have people like me, um, Raxworthy, Connolly and Brock all kind of describing the same thing, Brock describing it techno-science, Connolly describing it as a landscape urbanism, design assemblage, a series of practices, uh, Raxworthy descri describing it as process discourse, and myself describing it as systems-based design. So in a way my whole body of practice is a critique of that kind of standard uh, scientifically driven uh, non-site attentiveness to landscape architecture. So these are the kind of projects you kind of get out of it, right? We have LC, I, think, I do believe the last one is um, LCLU, or it could be uh, lateral office, that is, that's right up there, lateral office. Um, you have these kind of really um, algorithmically driven designs on top right there, which have no kind of, um, there's a really fascination with quantity, quantities of metrics as a means to create design. There's no sense of landscape in that kind of projects at all. And to kind of pick on field operations a little bit here, the initial scheme for uh, fresh kills had no engagement with that landscape at all beyond um, ecological programming. It was only when you go uh, look at the more recent uh, sort of section, um, like of sectors of that park documentation, we actually see them looking at the landscape itself. What is that place going to be aesthetically? So that was all kind of at a time where that, that kind of uh, scientific understanding of the world was really kind of right at the top of the um, agenda in kind of the early 2000s. And to kind of toot my own horn a little bit, um, I thought it was kind of a nice quote. Um, so the ecological has been given a lot of attention recently in landscape architectural theory and practice. Yet yeah, what we describe as the ecological is reduced to what can be measured uh, and made to exist under the reign of the technic. Anything else is exiled. If you can't give it a quantity, a metric, or an exterior criterion to judge it, it's gone. It doesn't fit into the standard design practice. And I hope you can feel some kind of resonance that that is a very problematic thing, but it doesn't get recognised by the vast majority of landscape architectural designers or academics. So where I step into this, how do you view the landscape from the middle, to borrow the words in Tari's term? How do you see how do you see how things are relevant all around you in terms of an ecological sense? That requires an understanding of aesthetics. And I'll kind of explain through some work examples that later on. So if we want to rethink how we're engaging the world ecologically, how we do it for design, I would argue perhaps the best way to do that is to think about how we engage with encounters, encounters with landscape as our way in. Something in the world forces us to think. There's something in the world is not an object of recognition, it's not logical, it's not rational, it's not conscious, it's not subjective, it doesn't come from your own thoughts, but it's on a fundamental encounter, there's a force which gets you to do something out in the world. The landscape gets you to do something. And so these are these two really influential figures. And so my work is a, basically an apprenticeship to the work of these two guys here. Felix Katari, a psychoanalyst, ran his own clinic outside of Paris. And Gilles Deleuze, possibly the most influential uh, philosopher 
of the 20th century, still incredibly influential now. And together the pair of them joined up together and did some weird and wacky work. Um, but through, you could not walk into any good architecture school around the world and not see someone practicing, teaching, without some kind of influence on these two. And that counts on landscape too, because landscape urbanism, that's all them. So key for these guys is notions of effect and assemblage. We can think about assemblage as machines. Ecology is like a machine, right? All kinds of actors and agents and forces flying around to produce something. Weather patterns being a product of ecology. This is an assemblage here of, um, this is a lecture assemblage, right? I'm up here talking, you're here because you feel some obligation because I'm a professor, or very forceful obligation because Jen is taking um, attendance. Um, we got kind of a big enough screen here that you guys can see at the back. I'm kind of project my voice, but also speak slow enough that you can understand me past my accent. You're in like nice rigid rows. So there's all these things that kind of come together to produce a lecture assemblage, right? If we were to do this out in the quad, it'd be a totally different machine totally different effects being produced. And so how do you try and unpack these symbolages of the landscape? And to do so, it really requires looking at the whole open continuum of landscape itself. Where do you stop when it comes to looking at landscape? The common you know, idea of when you compare landscape to architecture, architects work with a site, landscape architects don't have a site, where is the boundaries of where my design begins and starts? You need to kind of have the same idea when it comes to looking at landscape itself. And so this little rhizomatic diagram here kind of explains that, right? There's no start or end to any point of this. You can keep going, it just goes snakes in and around. For those of you who've done a little bit of plant stuff, you'd know the difference between a rhizomatic plant root structure and like a single or tap root root structure, right? Where's a start and an end. So the Lewis and Guattari, that is how the world operates, right? Everything's interconnected to varying degrees. But you, there's no start and end to it, right? So how do you view the landscape in the same way? And for Spinoza, Barak Spinoza, a uh, Jewish philosopher in the 1600s, um, he started talking about effect and, and kind of describing that sensation is kind of the basis of all knowledge. It's not thought, it's not our ideas, it's not concepts. It's sensation which gets the body, and the brain is an organ. The brain operates before you think. Your thoughts are kind of lame in a way compared to how complex the brain works before you even think. And so how does those sensations, how do those relations that operate pre-subjectively before your character, your personality, pre-consciously and involuntarily, how does that get you to move through the world? And how the hell... Have a look at that. Well, I can have a drink of water before I burn my voice out. <laughs> Wes, what happens when you look at that painting? You notice the different patterns from where I look at it. Yeah. Some colors appear more prominent than others. Yep. Cool. Jen, what do you reckon? What do you think happens when you look at that? Okay. Anyone from the, the second year crowd? I'm sorry, I don't quite know your names yet, but we'll get there. Maybe you can pick one out from again. What happens when you look at that painting? It's not intellectual, it's not academic, it's dumb as all hell. Go for it. Okay. Does anyone find their eyes moving through that painting in a certain way? Like it kind of tracks around? You joke? Oh, okay, sorry about that. <laughs> Not sure the painter would have quite the same effect on you. But does anyone kind of find like the, maybe the eyes kind of flip between the bright bits or dark bits? Do you kind of see the like, black circles appearing, appearing in the grid? Do you find yourself kind of going row by row or just kind of lazily moving through or quickly moving through? Yeah? Those are all effects. Those are, that's an involuntary thing which the world is painting is getting your brain to do, right? So when we talk about illusions, correct me, like visual illusions, that kind of thing, those are effects. It's like your brain going a little bit haywire because there's a sensation there which is kind of breaking its habitual responses. And so that's a very basic example, but that same principle stands for how we should, how we do, how we do experience landscape and how we can start to design with it. It gets a hell of a lot more complex when you get to the landscape, right? 
this is a quarry I used for my PhD. And as you walk up to this great big rock, rock face, there's this kind of process of looming. You, you feel looming. You feel, uh, a little bit cliche, but you kind of feel a sense of dread in your gut, right? You feel more heaviness on your shoulders as you start to move up to here. And there's a certain point as you're moving up, you kind of, kind of around about here at this point, you're kind of like wandering around away, away from it in like a circular fashion. Almost because there's a trepidation, a little bit of an uneasiness of wanting to get closer. But at a certain point, you start to get sucked in. It really starts to draw you into it. And the closer and closer you get to it, the more your eyes are kind of really dragged up to the top of it. It starts to push your upper body back. You're tilting your head back. And at a certain point, around about here, you feel completely and utterly arrested. Time stops. You lose your sense of time and space there because you're basically short-circuited how your brain is meant to relate and understand to landscape. This is such an otherworldly and alien sort of bodily environment relations created here that your brain, for whether it was 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 2 minutes, it kind of just needs to sit down and have a break and come back to it later. Those are all bodily relations, right? Your eyes are trying to keep track of the top of that, and so you're tilting your upper body back. You're tilting your eyes up. That's creating a really, um, uh, what's instinctual is kind of a, an easy way in to describe it, but like tilting your body back like that, it's kind of creating a real threat response deep down in your little lizard brain to expose your neck like that, because you're trying to keep track of it. And so that creates that sense of fear, that looming, which for me certainly would be called a sense of the sublime. That kind of haywire, that breaking, that short-circuiting for me is the sublime. And eventually, you know, once your brain gets its act back together, your kind of whole sense of landscape collapses down and focuses right in front of you on the visceral, like, gouging materiality of that rock face, whereas before that was just not even in your sense of the world at that time. So it's a very rapid escalation of sense of space, scale, and your body's relation to that, and then almost immediate collapsing back down. So that was just, that was like one little mini study um, that I did on my PhD. And so that was a kind of a means to think about how to treat encounters, sensation, and experience you know, seriously. How do you not treat it as just something that's merely subjective? I can tell you from my side of the academic sense, the amount of um, other academics and particularly practitioners who have come into a crit and this uh, student has done something engaging with an experiential aspect of a landscape and they've just gone, well, it's just subjective. I'm not going to go out there and experience that. If I went out there, you're going to tell me that your design is going to produce this for everyone. Well, that's not what a student was trying to do. They were trying to experiment with the world in a way which was different than just the standard approach. But if I was to, you know, hopefully the description that I described you walking up to that rock face, hopefully there was just even just a little bit of resonance with you. Even if you just kind of followed me along and gave me that, um, that little bit of, you know, benefit of the doubt, that's, that's more than enough. That's more than enough to start to get designing with. And that relates to how do we see ourselves as entangled with the world? How do we understand the milieu as one of the reflexes of the landscape project? It's like before using one's brain, there had to be a primitive relationship between one and the landscape concerning the whole being and all the space that surrounds it. So Clarence and Mossbach at this time, when they wrote this in Pages Passage, one of the most famous French landscape architectural journals, they were students, they were about fourth year, I think, um, and wrote one of the most impactful but most incredibly unknown essays within this one, I would argue. They describe more or less what I'm describing here way back when. And Mark Claremont, I don't actually know what Mark Claremont's up to these days, but Catherine Mossbach is probably one of the most preeminent French landscape architects we have currently. She is incredibly sensible to landscape and is sensible to everything that I'm kind of talking about here as well. So we're kind of moving towards a, a discipline that is an entangled practice. We're working and seeing the world and designing with the world as a flat ontology where humans are no longer hovering above the landscape and the landscape is for us. It's a very old school biblical sense of what the world is. We're now seeing us as just another entity out there in the sea of other non-human entities, right? So we're equally as important in the whole world as the pressed MDF that makes up these chairs, the air floating in the room, the ground hole out there in the grass, right? There's nothing separating us from them in terms of importance. 
they've all got their own agency and they've all got their own ways of forming assemblages in the world. And how to appreciate that, right? How do you design for that kind of agency? Not designing for them in like an ecological sense where they have certain ecological needs, but how to engage with how they live their lives, how they navigate the world. How do you design for the social life of a rock? It's a hell of a good challenge that anyone can figure that out. But if you can design for the social life of a rock, I reckon you can design just about anything. And a key part of that is moving beyond that bottom part, that subject-object dualism. That is something which has plagued the Western world since Descartes. Descartes created a serious um, ontological issue when he said, I think, therefore I am. He separated the human mind from the landscape itself. So we're no longer separate from the world. We're fully embedded in it. We're not out there observing it from the uh, window on the other side. Uh, oh, we can't talk about that. That's all right. So landscapes are these crazy, wild, varying kind of places that you know, vary. And I would certainly say this, it turns my brain to mush when I go out to a landscape, right? How do you, you know, when you go out to a site, right, like where do you begin? Does anyone feel like, anyone in here feel like they, when they go out for a site visit, you have a really good idea about where to begin? Yeah? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a wild place, right? It's just, you don't know where to start. You kind of have to go along and make things up as you go and you know, follow your, you should be following your own nose, following your, your intuition, right? Landscapes are wild. I like architects. Architects have this beauty of designing objects, typically in CAD space. They can, they can design straight from ideas. Landscape architects, you can never straight design straight from ideas. You're always working with the literal material of the site, earth, vegetation, forces, uh, you know, geologic forces, energy forces. Of course, we can import some of our ideas into a, into a design, but it's a whole, hell of a lot different um, way of designing than architecture. And that should be really embraced. And that last bit there, how do you as a student rise to the occasion of that challenge? How do you embrace the complexity and interestingness of landscape, right? A lot of architects I've taught and worked alongside, once they figure out how, they, how we work, they're incredibly jealous because we have this whole breadth of things that they don't necessarily get to play with. But on the other side, architecture has an incredible power to be iterative, to be really fast with design decision making, because they can do everything in CAD space. They can just add ideas in, add form in, and not worry about some of the complexities we'll do, we do. So how do you rise to the occasion of your own discipline? So that experience of looming, walking up to that quarry face I described before, these are some of the drawings which I tried to do to unpack it, right? So like a plan, describing the rough kind of boundaries of where those kind of different experiences were. On the right hand side, the lighter blue, we have that kind of wandering, trying to avoid that looming. That red, we kind of sucks you in, that looming starts to build up. And that darker blue on the left hand side, right at the bottom of the, of the face, is where that kind of collapsing, that material collapse kind of happens. And the diagram on the left hand side there, that's kind of describing the assemblage, the relevant agents and uh, relations that came to produce those experiences. Then using drawings, photographs, diagrams, text, whatever, whatever you need to rebuild that experience of someone reading that in exactly the same way I did just before, just through speaking to you, right? So, you know, my PhD was littered with, you know, hundreds and hundreds of drawings like this, all trying to rebuild those spatial and temporal relationships which create that experience on the page. The idea is, once you draw them, as with anything, once you draw it, you can design with it. So those, those spatial relationships are drawn out on the page. Simple little alterations to topography um, can create exaggerate, extend, multiply those experiences on site. So whereas the ground plane for that experience I described to you was based perfectly flat, what I did was basically tilt it up and create like a peak like that. So as you're walking towards it, you're walking up an incline. So that, can, that sense of looming is increased because your whole body is now tilted back as you walk towards it. And you reach the peak where I designed, designed the looming to be mostly tense. You're really held there. Once you pass that point, you're walking on a decline. And so you don't even have any ability to see that height up there. So simple little spatial alterations like that um, to just twist and play around with what the world does. Another example is walking through another part of the quarry where in a very short time uh, you know, space and time, there's this really rapid oscillation of a feeling of contraction and expansion and describing the different types. I'll call this like an ecology drawing, right? There's an ecology of experience here, right? All different kinds of experiencing. So it's all kind of numbered up, you know, use things, you know, little sentences to describe what that is. 
And then I'd start to unpack all the relationships involved in that, describing it, so that as you read the drawings or reading the text, the experiential narrative text, using photographs, edited photographs to bring out what's relevant and all of that. You know, something like summary drawings of the, of the sense of scale and scope as you move through it. All in a way, all in a kind of methodology of looking at what exists in extensive space, Cartesian, XYZ space, so things, you know, we can describe this table here in XYZ space by saying it's, you know, maybe three inches thick and maybe like four feet off the ground, um, I don't know, was that, like nine feet long, something like that. But that does nothing to describe the intensive qualities of it, those experiential encounter effectual qualities of it. We're starting off with the, the extensive space, what it have, what exists, kind of the existence experience and reality. That's just like a base layer. And then starting to unpack what are those um, intensive qualities about it. The topographical ground edge and the feeling of that where the topography starts to meet down that and start to push you around. Horizon defined topographical edges. So it's kind of like this overlapping, you're moving through a whole series of like overlapping edges as you move through here. The degree of push created by those edges as they meet the ground plane. So these are all felt things, all things felt on the site. Strongly defined flat areas, which are a very peculiar thing in a quarry, apart from you know, the great big flat base, if you're lucky to have one. So to experience a large degree of flatness there was quite peculiar in relation to everything else going on. Overlapping ground plane horizons, so there's a sense of like uh, rapid unfolding in some places and then very slow unfolding in others. And all these were kind of printed out on transparent um, sheets so you could see how they interact and interrelate with each other. It's very tricky to do on a digital screen. And then a design to follow that, to build on top of that. So I kind of elevated some landform in there, you can kind of see all the busy line work in there, um, to kind of exaggerate that sense of um, compression and contraction at the same time as playing into the whole program of creating a large regional park within this quarry. The sections to go along with it, describing what the effectual qualities are, what are the experiential qualities that have been created through adjusting space and time. And then kind of pairing that up with um, some view shed based analysis. So if this whole if this whole experience was about a sense of um, compression and uh, expansion, view sheds have a really key part to do with that, right? What you see around you creates that kind of sensation. So on the left hand side of these diagrams is the view shed for certain points through that walk in the blue, the, the existing, and then the red is the design one. So you can kind of see just in compa comparing the two that I'm really starting to play with exaggerating or taking away places are those kind of views in, in certain ways. And you can do a composite overlay with that. But the sheer degree of extra view or sense of expansion is way more than a lot of other places. Uh, but it's a little bit harder to tell where it's been, the contraction has been increased um, just because of the way the graphic works. But trust me, it's there. And so Claire Colbrook um, has a fantastic uh, quote here. So effect or intensity is not the meaning of an experience, but the response it promotes. Meaning is kind of meaningless in a way, to a degree. Um, this as far as like this kind of thing goes, like what your meaning, what your understanding, what meaning you attach to it um, is only as far as you can push it, right? You want to see how far you can make this kind of universal in the way, and effects are universal, they're kind of, because um, they're, cause they're pre-subjective, they're involuntary, they go beyond just subjectivity. And so for me, this is like the material and power of landscape, and so you have to kind of rise up and engage with this as a, a challenge to your design practices, right? You want to look at how landscapes move us, how they create doings, forms of social and public life, human, non-human assemblages, and allow for processes of becoming. So everything that like uh, William H. White um, and kind of the 60s and 70s kind of environmental psychology crowd are talking about, they're basically talking about effects in a very um, scientific way. J.J. Gibson, I will quote him to the end of days, he is an um, environmental psychologist talking about affordances, but he's talking about effects, how places get you to do certain things. This allows us a way in to engaging with the world. It bypasses generality by talking about specificity of things. And it really encourages an experimentation with the world. Um, I might speed up a little bit. How do we look at this in terms of research, right? How do we start to rethink how we approach and engage with research with this in mind? So some of the kind of, I guess it's a little bit more like explaining what I'm up to now, not necessarily a, a meta-commentary on disciplinary things. 
but hopefully you can see how I'm attacking things from my own perspective um, embodies those same approaches. So I have an ongoing research relationship with my own institution, Victoria University of Wellington, and in the nascent stages of unfolding in Botamiskel, which is the largest landscape architectural firm in New Zealand. So they involve urban planners, landscape architects, ecologists, urban designers, the whole crowd right there. They're like the Sasaki, probably more comprehensive in scope than Sasaki, but obviously not as big. Um, so we have a really good um, research project kind of in the wings. It's certainly on the way with VUW. We're just waiting for the paperwork for Botham Miskel to <laughs> get finalised for that one, right? So instead of using drones and LIDAR in a standard kind of design way and certainly engineering or scientific way, where they would, um, they want kind of the precision of landscape in order to run simulations or to do um, ecological modelling and that kind of thing. What me and Peter, who's talking next week, are really interested in, in that is how do you get that, how do you use that super detailed spatial recording to begin to design with those material qualities, those bodily qualities in relationship to landscape, instead of just relying, I shouldn't say just, but um, relying on uh, just what you kind of can record on site, kind of adding, adding the extra level of spatial fidelity. One of my main kind of projects at the moment when I spoke with, I did a, was at a panel with the um, School of Mining Engineering here at BT and four other universities. Um, I kind of introduced them to a uh, project, kind of research project they're working on. We're embedding landscape architects into the process of quarrying. There's something to aim for, uh, both at a societal level and from an economic level. Because often when landscape architects engage with quarries and mines, we're coming in as the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. We're coming in once that, co that quarrying company's left, there's no money to do the job, and we end up just doing a greenwashing under the banner of sustainability. So how do you embed a landscape architect into the problem where form is being generated through the process of quarrying, not just standard old revegetation processes? And tied to that is um, a project which we applied some funding for, led to a series of quarries in Northern Virginia, DC and Maryland, at this point in time described as topographic specters. So how do we... I'll read this out, I won't, I won't read that actually. Um, too long, my voice is, I can feel my voice starting to go as it is. But more or less I'm looking at a series of quarries in North Virginia and how they relate to the geology beneath them, the subterranean world, the whole world of effects beneath the ground. And so there's a tone map over here, DC is up near the fork, um, Fairfax, Northern Virginia, on the left hand side of that tone map river branch. And all these little red bits here are quarries major ongoing quarries around that part of um, Nova, DC and Maryland. And beneath that are the three major kind of geologic stratas operating in that part of the landscape. This little part of the coastal plain along here, so this is all sand and whatnot, a lot of gravels. And over there you have the um, lower reaches of Piedmont, so you're kind of getting a bit of granite, a bit of nice, uh, a little bit of um, grey wacky. And so you have this whole ecology, or this whole unseen material ecology happening beneath the ground. Starting to play around with this, you know, slightly closer scale. How do you interact with people's daily lives, right? Kind of abstracting out those relationships. So again, the red represents the spatial extent of each of these quarries. Um, and for each of these quarries, they're kind of extracting roughly the same material, right? I honestly couldn't tell you what that material is off the top of my head. Did these about six months ago. Um, that's the joy of digital drawing, because you can always go see what the key <laughs> was. I probably should have had that in there for you guys. But you can see in here all the footprints for the houses, the suburban, the urban field all around it, sitting atop that geology. Jamie Oliver, many years ago, described there's a crisis where kids don't know where their food comes from anymore. They don't know the processes of where food comes from. If I was showing you kids saying that our state came from a tree. Right now we have a crisis of materiality. People do not know where the material comes from. You don't, we have no idea as a society where the concrete comes from that paved your road, where the floor plate came from, where the slate which makes up your garden tiles came from. The whole supply chain is so obscured, it removes, and that's intentional, right? That removes um, our responsibility and obligation from the individual for sustainable purposes, right? So it can obscure those sustainable or insustainable supply chain links. And so how do we start to re-envisage our urban fields to kind of break that chain? This is what this project's kind of about. How do we give expression to the underlying geologic strata? How do we start to work with that um, 
in an effectual sense. And these are some of the drawings I started playing around with when I first started, when I first moved here. Taking a look at some of the quarries, doing a you know, classic compare and contrast analysis, looking at the form, the function, the scale, and then looking at how they fit into their existing urban fields, right? Some of these, most of them, yeah, the three of them at least, are functionally isolated from their surrounding urban field by barriers, highways, freeways. I can sure tell you as soon as I moved here, I noticed how much even small towns like Blacksburg are carved up by infrastructure. Quarries with potential for a strong urban field relationship. There's no barriers there. There could be something really interesting where suburbia or urban, the actual you know, dense urbanity comes up and engages with that quarry post use or in use. Some with um, some, yeah, potential for some, but also some with ambiguous. How can you start to unpack those and find a potential in that as well? And so this is all part of developing a geologically orientated form of landscape urban urbanism. Note I'm not calling it a landscape urbanism. Landscape driven, very different, very different thing. <laughs> it's not the language around it has been particularly well, well articulated, but it's coming out of a practice from Australasia, Australia, and New Zealand, where we're coming at designing from, at an urbanism scale from the ground up, not from the infrastructural scientific down. Um, so, if any of you've been to Central Park, you'd know these great big rocks here. Um, that's there. Uh, when Olmsted designed Central Park, he removes. I think it's like between 40 and 60 million cartloads of earth from that site in order to, exp to uncover these, the geology of the Manhattan Peninsula, whatever it is, island. Because um, it's an expression of geologic time and force. These are the remnants of the glacial processes which covered the entirety of North America. And to uncover those and structure an entire park around them, which has a city now of 8 or 12 million people right, living right around it, that's an incredible thing, and the whole park lives off of that. It thrives off of that. You can feel the vibrancy of that. So how do you take that same kind of methodology and apply it at an urban field, right? And so I started to play around with this and some of my prior design studies where I had these really interesting gullies um, on the outside of the quarry. You can't see the quarry, but the quarry there. And I was doing a whole bunch of urbanism, trying to get a certain critical mass of people living around the quarry. Um, so it wasn't just a park you would drive to, it would be part of people's everyday lives. So that's why I always argue a good landscape architect is a good urban designer. A good, lands good landscape architect's design is good urban design, because you should be thinking about these things at the same time. And what I ended up doing was, I'm sorry about the I'm not exactly explaining that in the crispest way, um, but was structuring densities of urbanism. Of, or didn't, didn't get down, I initially started putting in houses everywhere, you know, footprint by footprint. But that just been a nightmare, and so I abstracted that out and started playing around with the grid, um, cutting across this whole rippling landscape and increasing the density around the entry points to these gullies. And all through those gullies would be a series of walking paths connecting through that kind of weird rippling landscape, but also connecting you to the quarry itself. And so that was kind of like an urbanism based around folds, around dense vegetation and the materiality of the quarry. That's just one example. So how can we start to, my challenge now is, this is odd me, I haven't, haven't solved it yet, but I intend to. Um, how do we start to play around with that in a geologic sense? How do we reconfigure the American approach to suburbanism? Because right now it's pretty landscape insensitive, as I'm sure you all must, maybe not the second years yet, you haven't quite got to the urban level of thinking, but the fifth and fourth years, and probably you guys talked a little bit about it with you guys, it's very landscape insensitive beyond course the water stuff we're all dealing with now because that's what that's you know, a pretty key part so how can we start to envisage um, laying out urban fields where you kind of expose that geology or design it directly where that geology is exposed kind of like how Ong said the word central park how do you have that urban grid butt up right against it how do you feel like that geologic force that expression of deep time and those processes are like part of your backyard part of your everyday commute part of everything you do, buy, construct, and throw away. And so these are just some little doodling diagrams I did um, with one of the earlier Fridays at 1.30 talks. So you should be doing the same, <laughs> always doodling while you're hearing, hearing good ideas. But that kind of, yeah, sentence down the bottom kind of describes what I'm trying to do. Developing a landscape driven urbanism for development that brings geologic and topographic forces into contact with everyday life and rhythms. And I think I might wrap that up there, Finn. <laughs> uh.
uh, questions? <laughs> yes, good. So uh, I know when you're talking about uh, operationalizing different systems that may not be super apparent, like this idea of the sublime, mm -hmm. you know, this very effectual experiences that you know, historically have been only like, so I guess it's something that can be sort of subjectively but how do you manage the complexity of every individual in this room coming with a different experience to um, whatever landscape or you know, actual experience it is, uh, knowing that you know, all those different experiences may create a slightly different idea mm. of that? How do you operationalize that? Yep. So that's a fantastic question. and. I'll start that off by referring to Edmund Burke, one of the preeminent thinkers on the sublime. So you have Immanuel Kant, um, the other main thinker on the old school version of sublime, who regarded the sublime as a very subjective um, sort of intellectual thing. It's all about rational mind and how it engages the landscape. Burke, on the other side, regarded it as a physiological, a bodily sensation pre-thought operation, right? And so for him, because we're all roughly made of the same meat, bones, nerves, roughly, you know, 95% is probably the same composition, right? There's a relative commonality as a species around that. So someone like um, Uberdale Price worked with that and sent the picturesque on his counterpart, Richard Payne Knight, um, because he was a particularly, I don't want to say snobby, but very intellectual man, he understood how those experiences operate in terms of association. So. What that essentially means is, are you educated enough to understand that you are having this experience? Um, which brings me back to your question, um, and tying it back to Burke as well. Because we're all roughly made up of the same stuff, no matter race, creed, gender, height, sex, weight, um, how what our, our gait, maybe our, our way we walk changes things slightly, because we all have a relative commonality to that, um, and the fact that these experiences, effects happen pre-consciously, there is a degree of sharedness. Um, how that kind of instigates um, and how that kind of flows into your own thoughts and subjective kind of things that flow into that, that's kind of a different thing, right? Because we do have um, different bodily experience, the bodily memory. Bodily memory is a really important part of this, right? Like going to cross the road as a child is an incredibly traumatic thing, right? <laughs> There's so much going on, everything's fast, everything's way bigger than you, but you slowly build up a bodily memory of how to do it. And I guarantee that nearly every single one of you can cross a road without even thinking about it. I'll cross roads and not even thought of, like, I cross the other side, like, holy hell, how did I get here? Like, it happens on pure habit. So we all kind of have this kind of shared, not, we don't all share the same bodily memory, but we have this commonality in that kind of bodily memory and kind of shared habitualness. And so you can kind of find, you kind of, you, the challenge is to use your drawings or uh, text photographs in a way where it draws that out. And it won't be the same for every, you know, 100% because um, there'll be things I've experienced in the world that you haven't and vice versa, but there'll be kind of enough, an, enough analogous kind of experiences that we can kind of draw out enough that it, you can come to like a common ground, right? So it's never a one-to-one. -one. Um, drawings can never represent exactly what you felt on the site, right? But it's, it's communicating enough so that someone else can at least feel or understand what you're talking about and then start to design with yourself. So the same thing we're talking about with other people. Do you, can you come to a common ground on it? Did I answer your question? Yes. Cool. Oh, it's a complex one, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, but take. <laughs> Go for it. Are you uh, looking at the uh, two times around here? The red one you can Not as of yet. Um, coal mining is a whole kettle of fish. I'm not quite sure I have the... Um, uh, technical know-how as to do yet, but I had a fantastic um, Zoom call um, with someone kind of like my age and kind of academic experience in Australia um, who I cited quite a lot but finally got around to having a chat with. And her experience is with subterranean coal mines. And so we had a really fantastic chat um, about her work with uh, that kind of stuff and my interest in the subterranean geology and expression to it. So she's kind of working in that area of coal mining now in Australia. Um, so kind of see where that relationship goes, because obviously I'm in Virginia and West, West Virginia, <laughs> there's a whole stack of coal mines. <laughs>
Not sure I could speak to Asian, um, but I can speak a little bit to European. Um, so, and again, I'm only, I've, I've spent a little bit of time um, more intellectually than physically in the other two landscape architecture schools in New Zealand. But I can speak to my own. Um, for us, it's really, uh, as I've told my few third years my, in our class, we're much more design heavy, much more design rigor and uh, you know, I guess power and force of design. In here, where it's much kind of much closer relationship to civil engineering. So in New Zealand, it's much more kind of broken up into different fields. So designer, landscape architect, does landscape architectural things. Civil engineer does the civil engineering. Uh, ecological engineers come in and do their thing. So we're much more kind of. Um, I don't. I hate to say the, the pureness of design because that's just not really what it's about. But it's much more about um, strong design outcomes first, and then get bring in the engineers, make sure they can fix it. But without killing your design problems, because that was always a, that's always a problem, right? When you um, so you kind of focus so much on design, you don't know how you may not know how to engage with other professionals in a way where they don't kill what you want to do. Compare that to Europe. Um, European landscape architecture, from my understanding, has just that incredible sensitivity to materiality, place, history, and culture, and so they have very very subtle, but incredibly moving ways of design, where it's not so much about structure or um, even natural ecology, it's like kind of like peeling away the dross which is hiding that and giving expression to that. So kind of the geologic stuff that I've talked about probably would kind of resonate with that. A lot of French landscape architects, um, when they design form, it's just like, you know, if, if there was an old kind of stream here, like kind of a high, hydrological profile, how do you just kind of give little hints to it, little subtle hints to that process side? instead of kind of um, daylighting it or chucking it through paving and that kind of thing. So they're, they're experts at unpeeling layers of history, not being kind of in your face with it. As for Asia, I honestly couldn't <laughs> speak for that with any kind of rigor. But got you and Jay only that could, so I don't want to um, step on your toes. Mm. Mm. So there's a whole ecology of different practices out there, right? So how you fit into that is an interesting challenge as you go forward. Oh, yes? Yeah. up a good point because it, it brings up the, um, the shared and group of discipline, yeah. right? A discipline is a body of thinkers, practices, designers engaging in a shared form of inquiry. And I was um, talking with Owen the other day and we were kind of describing like, you know, kind of figure out what her research question is might be for her master's um, thesis. And uh, I was kind of describing to her like, you're a, you know, there are people who have tackled this similar problem to you. It's not your 
um, grand idea, your grand research question. There are others who have gone out there and, and grappled with that same thing. And so your challenge is to figure out you know, how do they engage with that question, how do they engage with that same problem. It may it wouldn't be the exact same cycle from design, but it's the same kind of challenges they're engaging with. And so owning up to that and kind of what's like being, a little, being quite humble in a way and kind of understanding that you're just one little thinker in, in a shared collective inquiry, right? Even as students doing your design projects, like how do you find precedence? It's not all about finding precedence, which you're doing exactly what you want to do. You want to find out people who tackle that same or similar problem and being humble enough to um, look at that as a way, to, as a learning opportunity to see how they grappled and solved that problem if they did. And take that and go, you know, stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, you may not go further than them, but you may um, open up another line of inquiry. Yep. Um, I'm just curious about the current research. Yeah. So I'm not really familiar with the uh, practice-based PhD. I'm, I'm doing really traditional mm. research, of research, finding research data and collecting data and quantitative analysis. So my question is, uh, so what kind of like uh, outcomes do you expect from the current research? Do you make some suggestion for design? Yeah, so it kind of depends on the, the the different aspects of it, right? Like I want to continue that creative practice research output and that's a completely valid um, uh, form of research output. It took a while to certainly argue for that to be valid internationally. It was only really recently that drawings could be considered as an output of research. Um, and for most universities in the US, you cannot do the kind of research that I do as a PhD, which is design-led. It has to be kind of traditional, right? And BT has a little bit of experimentation with that. Not sure how long that'll live on for, but we'll see. Um, but, you know, I did, uh, you know, all the kind of writing I did in that, that you know, that's um, philosophical inquiries so that we put out in form of journal, standard journal articles. Um, I have an article with JOLA, Journal of Ar Architecture, in the next issue, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. Um, that's talking a little bit of a summary of the, the, the commentary of how I approach post mining landscapes. Um, of course, everything, because I was working really, you know, quite rigorously and as far as landscape architect can do and mining engineering. Um, so I want to make some stand you. Typical scholarly contributions to that and mining journals and things like that through these collaborations as well. But it's kind of like using design as the kind of the way you burrow through the research instead of doing it through the standard kind of text or literature search kind of way. Same kind of outcomes, right? Or similar kind of outcomes, just through a different methodology. It's much more like the work of Richard Payne Knight and Nobel Price, that polymathic poet, designer, scholar, politician kind of thing, than uh, the sole scientist in the, in the lab. Yeah. Any last one, any last questions? I can, I can handle one more if my voice gives out. <laughs> but if there's none, I'm quite happy to give it a break. <laughs> yes, Jake, lucky, lucky last. <laughs> That's been an interesting one because, like, I would kind of um, from like I, I haven't still the studio yet. Yeah. Um, so that's been like I haven't really kind of like had my task to kind of put my flag in the ground as of yet. Um, but working with Rachel and Jessica on this senior project, like I've just like thrown them into the deep end of just like designing straight away. Um, this is something I learned from um, not my master's thesis supervisor, but um, he was faculty in the program. They would start us off um, with spending two weeks just doing design straight away for your master's thesis as a way to figure out what you need to know. Because if you just, as I told Rachel and Jessica, if you just start out and think, okay, I've got this project, what I want to do, um, how do I, how the hell do I start this? The world's so big, I've got this huge topic. Um, you kind of get basic analysis paralysis. You don't know where to start. You can't get your teeth into the problem. 
Whereas if you start designing, you start to whittle away things which are irrelevant straight away. You can cut down half your topic area because it's just not where design leads your next site into that problem. And so that immediately points you towards areas of inquiry, areas of where you need to do traditional research to figure out you know, Rachel for nuclear problems, Jessica for the operations of the prism. And so yeah. I, I think it's a fantastic way to start. Um, and as for kind of more undergraduate kind of studio teaching, um, I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> Doing a lot of site analysis, I, like I typically would um, kind of and, and off, yeah, participate in studios where like first six weeks and weeks of all field work and analysis on the site itself. And then the last is kind of experimentation design with that in relation to a technical but instrumental problem. So how do you solve a technical problem of flooding in a major city, but from that kind of ground up aesthetic sense? So I don't know, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> cool, thank you very much guys. Oh, my voice. <laughs>